Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you are the accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word. May we put your word into practice now and always. Amen. In a March 1985 Guy Post magazine article, Luciano Pavarotti told the story of how he came to be a singer. When I was a boy, my father was a baker and my mother worked in a cigar factory. My father introduced me to the wonders of song. Our house was filled with recordings of the great tenors. When I was growing up, either the record player in our apartment was going full blast or father and I were singing. He had a fine tenor voice. <coughs> Excuse me. He was the church soloist and sang in all music productions in Moderna, our hometown in a small city in Italy. Mother loved my singing. Your voice touches me whenever you sing, she'd say. But she thought I should become an athletic instructor because I was so good at soccer, or at least an accountant. My father urged me to develop my voice. I sang two songs for Arrigo Pola, a teacher and professional tenor in my city. He agreed to teach me without fees because he found some qualities in my voice which he thought should be developed. I also enrolled in a teacher's college. On graduating, I again asked my father, shall I be a teacher or shall I be a singer? Luciano, my father said, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. I chose one. It took seven years of study and hard work and frustration, rejection, before I made my professional appearance. It took another seven years to reach the Metropolitan Opera. I was blessed with a good voice by God. I think it pleased him and I decided to devote myself to it. And now I think whether it's laying bricks or driving a straight nail, writing a book, whatever we choose, we should give ourselves to it. Commitment is the key. You need to choose one chair. Pavarotti made a choice with his life and then he made a commitment 
to that choice. In today's scripture, we find Jesus telling a very familiar parable. This story, in Markley's words, is one of the most vivid parables Jesus ever spoke, and the lesson is crystal clear. God will judge us in accordance with our reaction to human need. That means, like Pavarotti, we must choose, and then we must make a commitment with our lives to that choice. At first glance, it seems that when it comes to the sheep, the ones who follow God, and to the goats, the ones who do not, we as human beings have no say in the matter. In verse 31, Jesus states, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and the angels are with Him, He will sit on His throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. According to scriptures, it seems as though Jesus decides who is given eternal life and who is sent to the eternal fire. But as we read more of the parable, we learn that it is how people choose to live their lives, how they treat others, how they serve God, and how they did not do these things that seems to make the difference. What is this parable teaching us about the way we live and the help that we give to other people. Well, the first thing we learn here is that the righteous were judged by what they did for others and subsequently for Jesus. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one or the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Notice Jesus does not say, good job on your massive popularity. Your earthly wealth is vast, your intelligence is unsurpassed, and during your life you are one of the most materialistic people ever. Because of these things you are blessed. Come and sit at my right hand. Does not say that. I want to be clear. Does not say that. It is not these things that God cares for. It is how we care for others that is of prime importance. When we receive God's grace, it is a gift which means we cannot buy it or earn it, and we enter heaven because of God's grace in Christ. That doesn't mean we get to live any way we choose. It means that we live and follow God's path, which includes doing the things that Jesus would do. When Christ lived on earth, his focus was on loving, on forgiving, on accepting, on serving and healing and helping others. If our faith is such that we also live in the same manner, that then we do these things because, it, because it's the way Christ lived. Because it is what God wants and needs us to do. Because doing these things is the natural and grateful response to God's love. We do all that, then we can go out and we can give others our help. Like help turning the page. The second thing we learn from the passage is that the type of help we are supposed to give. Look at what Jesus tells us to do. Feeding someone that is hungry, clothing someone, offering a glass of water, inviting someone into your home, keeping someone company when they are ill, visiting someone in prison. Do you see the common denominator? Can you spot what these things all have in common? There are all things that we can absolutely they are all things that we can absolutely do. God's not asking us to give away millions of dollars. He's not telling us to invent the next life-changing device. We are not being asked to cure cancer or to go down in the annals of history. We are being asked to do simple, kind, loving acts that can make a difference in an individual's life. The third thing this passage teaches us is that there, and this is something that I think we forget, Jesus is our king. He uses royal language throughout this passage. In verse 25, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory. In verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right. In verse 40, the king will reply. We often think of Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, the light of the world, the Good Shepherd, as someone who is the way, the truth, and the life. But 
today is Christ the King Sunday. For Protestants, this is the Sunday that simply signifies the end of our liturgical year. Next Sunday is Advent. That begins a new liturgical year in the life of the church. The, uh, Christ the King Sunday can come as early as November 20th or as late as November 26th. But in addition to we start a new year in the church, Christ the King Sunday is a reminder, big surprise, that Jesus is our King. He reigns over our lives. His kingdom has no end. He rules in our hearts. He cares for us. He protects us. He guides us as any good king would. Our faith journey is much easier knowing that we belong to and that we are part of God's kingdom. And the final thing we learn today about giving is that when we help someone in need, we're helping Jesus. And when we don't help someone in need, we're not helping Jesus. When I read this scripture, it always reminds me of, a, of an incident in my past. I had been ordained about six months. And I was on my way to the hospital to visit a member of my church. And this lady had had a surgery and I was calling on her to see how she was doing. I actually called her on the phone and, and she agreed that I could come over. So I went right then and there. And I went to visit her, and she was expecting me, and, you know, kind of as you do. Now, near the main entrance of the hospital, there was a gazebo. And in that gazebo, there was a woman who was just beside herself with grief. She was sobbing and wailing and crying. And as I walked by, there was a, a, a wee voice in my head that said, maybe you should stop and see if there's something that you can do to help. But there was also another voice in my head that said, you also need to go inside because you have a member of your church that needs help that is expecting you to walk through the door. My highly educated, newly ordained brain decided to visit with my member first and then on my way out to see this lady and see what I could do to help. I came out of the hospital about 20 minutes later. The lady in the gazebo was gone. And I never saw her again. I never found out what was going on that faithful day. I never knew if I could have helped or made things worse with what she was going through. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And whatever you did not do, you did not do for me. So I've often asked myself, did I do for Jesus that day? By visiting a sick church member, I think I did. Did I not do for Jesus when I walked past the grieving woman? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I will tell you what I learned that day. I learned that I tried to live my life in such a way that the things I do will make God proud. I try to live by my own words that I say to all of you. Wherever you find yourself this week, Consider that God is placing you there. I try not to miss out on an opportunity to serve God. And sometimes our choices are not always yes or no and black and white. Sometimes my choice is to trust in God and let him decide if I'm making the right choice and doing the right things. Which brings us to our story for the day. Now, once there was a king, and this king reigned over his kingdom. And the first thing we have to establish, was he a good king or was he a bad king? Because when it comes to kings, they're either one of the, or the other. There's really not a, a, an in-between. And this king was a, was a very good king. He, he reigned his kingdom with kindness and with fairness. And no matter the opinions that his people had of him, all could say, if they were asked, he was a good king because he led with compassion and with justice. And this was got such a good king that his kingdom was enjoying, enjoying more prosperity than it had ever seen. People weren't moving away and going to other kingdoms. More and more and more people were coming in to be part of this kingdom. And when more people came in, it means you got more families, more children, more babies, and everything seemed to be prospering. 
And then one day, his advisors came to him and said, we have a problem. We have so many new people and so many new families. We're running out of milk to feed all the people in the kingdom. And we don't know what to do because we're not going to have enough milk for everybody. And this king was very fair and very just. And he said, here's what we're going to do. And he got his workers together and he said, go out behind the town square and I want you to dig me a pond. And I want you to make a nice, big, beautiful, round pond. And once it's dug, I want you to fill it with some sterile material in the bottom so that it's clean and preserved. And once that was done, the king put out his edicts to his entire kingdom. And he said, everyone is to donate one pail of milk to the pond tonight so that in the morning we can distribute it and everyone gets a fair share and everyone is taken care of in my kingdom. So at night, all the people got their pails and they all filled them up and they came to the pond. But there was one man in the village who thought, why should I have to do that? Why should I have to give up my milk? It's my milk. I made it. I earned it. It's for my family. I really don't want to share. So I'm just going to fill up a pail of water. I mean, it's dark. It's, it's at night. It's, it's one of those metal galvanized pails no one can see in. I'll just dump in the water and I'll go home. And everyone in the town will see that I gave like everybody else. So that's what he did. Everyone shows up, they're dumping in their pails. He dumps in his pail of water and he goes home. The next day the king gets up, he's excited about his new pond. He goes out to the square where the pond was made. He looks in and the entire pond is filled with water. There's not a drop of milk in the pond. Everybody thought, as the one man did, why should I have to do it when everyone else will help and get things done? And the kingdom never solved its crisis. We cannot wait or expect someone else to take care of the needs that we can do. And we're not asked to do incredible things. We're asked to do simple things in the name of God every single day. We're asked to serve Christ who reigns and rules in our hearts. We're asked not to expect or demand or wait for someone else to do it. And so it's up to us. And every day we can go forth from here as a people of God and make a difference. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day as we worship and sing and pray and love for you to come into our hearts now and forever. Amen.